Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome to another installment from Book Mecca. My name is Shaylin Scott. I'm the founder of Book Mecca, an online Black bookstore and literary platform for all things Black lit. We love to highlight Black authors, all of the Black literary art, especially the literature, and the wonderful work and voices of Black artists and creatives um, that exist. Today, we have a very special, special treat. This month has been amazing. We've had uh, all kinds of individuals speaking on mental health. And last week, you guys may have seen uh, the brothers talking about Black mental health and their realities in life. And today we have a very special guest. We have Marita Golden, acclaimed award-winning author here, talking about her latest work, as well as a, a platform of uh, women as well who have a background in mental health, from being strong women to uh, going through life together, all kinds of backgrounds. And I'll be happy to, to share all of that with you all. So be sure to share, like, Tell your friends to tune in now. We have plenty of time. This will be a really fun and engaging discussion. So you'll get to hear about Marita's latest work, which you should get for sure as well. And you'll get to hear from uh, a lot of other women who have some amazing stories who you'll be happy to follow too. So without further ado, I want to introduce Miss Marita Golden. I'll give you a little bit of background on her. Marita Golden is the author of 19 19 works of fiction and nonfiction. Her books have included everything from one of my favorite, The Wide Circumference of Love, to Us Against Alzheimer's, Stories of Family and Love and Faith, to her most recent work of nonfiction, The Strong Black Woman, How a Myth Endangers the Physical and Mental Health of Black Women. That's what we're going to be talking about today. That's a topic in itself. She is the award winner of so many types of awards from Barnes and Nobles, Poets and Writers, from the Authors Guild, Fictions Awards. I mean, her list is long, you guys, and we'll be sure to share that with everyone too. She's also the co-founder and president emeritus of the Zora Neale Hurston Richard Wright Foundation. She's a veteran teacher of writing, a literary consultant. She does workshops, coaching, manuscripts, evaluation services, I'm sure that the list is is out there. So without further ado, I want to introduce Miss Marita Golden. Welcome, welcome. Hello, Shaylon. I'm really glad to be here. We've been working on this for a long time, trying to get yes. together. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it just, it's so, um, it makes me feel so good to see you again. It's been so long and you were one of our earliest supporters of Book Mecca, even when I was just hitting people up randomly saying, you want to talk to me? So thank you for coming back on here again. I really okay. appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I let you know about this book early in the process yes. of writing it. And you said, save a place for me. Love it. Love it. And this book, I have it here on my little tablet here. If you have not already got it for all of you guys that are on here, I'll take uh, let you see what it looks like here. This is the book, The Strong Black Woman, How a Myth Endangers the Physical and Mental Health. Of black women. So if you have not picked up the book, pick it up for sure. All right. So let's dig down deep a little bit. Let's get started. So first question that came to mind is why now? Well, this is a book that I wrote as a result of a visit to the doctor. Mm. <laughs> I had no plans to write it, but um, I had kind of a health issue where I thought I was having a stroke back in around Christmas of 2019. I wasn't having a stroke, fortunately, but my um, doctor said, let's look a little closer and let's see what's going on there. And it turned out that after the MRI, the MRI revealed that I had had two silent strokes mm -hmm. sometime in the distant past. Now, a silent stroke is a stroke that you have you have no idea you've had it. You don't suffer any um, any diminishment of faculties, but you have had a stroke. And this was very concerning to me because my mother died when I was 21 of a stroke and my father died when I was 23 of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. So when I saw them die at that young age, I decided to be very healthy. So I started exercising 
eating right, experimenting with vegetarianism, meditating, going to therapy when I needed it, doing everything right. And I think it served me well, because if I hadn't had that very militantly um, positive health regimen, those two silent strokes might have been fatal. Mm. So that led me to thinking about my health, Black women's health, and the result was the strong Black woman. And when I went on the internet, I saw that there was a very vibrant, vital conversation going on, deconstructing, dismantling, and shattering mm -hmm. strong Black woman myth. And so I said, well, I have a story to tell. I want to be part of this. Well, I'm so glad that you told the story. Uh, for all of our viewers out there, to give you a little uh, backstory on the book, this is a brief synopsis of it. It's, okay, here we go. The Strong Black Woman examines mentality as a source of resilience for a million of African-American women and also a danger to their mental and physical health. The cultural belief in the near invincibility of Black women as bedrocks of their families and communities leads women to neglect their emotional and physical health as they prioritize the needs and requirements of others. The legacy of, of slavery and systemic racism has resulted in health statistics for Black women that are dire, and Black women lead in the incidence of stroke, heart attacks, and obesity-related illnesses and death. So that synopsis itself says a lot, and you cover it a lot of different topics in your book. It's really, um, really in depth, and it really gets you thinking not only about your own self, but about others around you, your girlfriends, your family, the choices that they've made too. So what was one of the biggest surprises that you had um, that you discovered in your research? Well, before we go further, I want to say two things. One is that we're living in a world where we're becoming more um, accepting of various genders. And I want to say that for the LGBTQ non-binary community, this is a conversation that is relevant. Mm -hmm. I also want to say that even though my focus is African-American women, uh, what studies have shown is that African descended women around the world who've experienced a legacy of slavery or colonialism also manifest the same strong black woman complex. And of course, we know that it grew out of our enslavement, where we were told that we were strong. We had to be strong. We had to be strong physically. We had to be strong mentally to survive slavery. And we were almost told that we were animals. We were treated like chattel. So what we did was we did language that was designed to diminish us, to dehumanize us, and turned it into language that, for Black women, uplifted us. We're strong. We're, we're resilient. You can throw anything at us. We would protect our families for the race, for our individual selves. We're, we're there. Um, and we're the first generation of women, of Black women, that's been able to see that there's a dark side to that mythology. Uh, I think everybody in the program tonight, we're very proud to say we are strong Black women. But we are now at a point where we're revising what strength means. So the strength means yes. vulnerability. It means asking for help. It means telling people, uh, pardon yeah. my expression, do it your damn self. <laughs> so, um, yeah. so we're in a new, we're in a new world. And um, probably the biggest surprise was when I talked to um, Dr. Kanika Bell, who's a therapist down in Atlanta, and she had done a study of. 50 black women who were therapists, psychologists, analysts, and their black female clients. Mm. And she gave them a survey and said, share with me your feelings about uh, happiness and contentment and joy. And the results of the survey revealed that for many of the clients and even some of the therapists, there was a feeling that joy is something that's for white women that black women are simply too busy trying to survive, too busy trying to um, resist the onslaught of racism, that we don't have time for joy. And that is part, of course, of the problem. Because mm -hmm. without joy, you can't survive. Without joy, you have really poor health. And many black women don't have a happy place in their lives. 
Yeah. I'm glad that you mentioned that because throughout reading the book, you poured a lot of yourself in the book. It was a lot of vulnerable moments um, that you wrote about your family and your upbringing and even your own health scares. So what were some things that you learned about yourself when you were writing the book? Well, um, I learned that even though I'm very healthy, there was still more work for me to do. That um, health is not a destination, it's a journey. Mm -hmm. And in the book, for example, I talk about being a cancer survivor who never called myself a cancer survivor because the tumor that was found was very small. I never went through radiation and chemo. So in my mind, it was like a friend of mine said, you consider it a pimple. <laughs> no, it was a tumor. But because I did not want to admit to having had cancer, even though I've done all the right things, got my head straight, um, I never used the big, the big C word. Yeah. And I realized that there's nothing wrong with acknowledging that I had cancer. And one thing about the book is the book, I interview therapists, health activists, um, health advocates, and many, many Black women uh, who told me stories of healing and trauma. And, um, you know, as we talk, I would like to read a couple of small sections to give people a sort of sense of how personal the book is, even as it does have statistics and mm -hmm. things like that. Absolutely. You mentioned uh, you had interviewed quite a number of experts and and women in your life. One in particular was Lauren Carson, and hopefully she can join us a little bit later today. Um, but tell us a little bit about Lauren. Well, Lauren uh, is a young woman who, when she was in college at the University of Virginia, recognized that she suffered from clinical depression. And she twice tried to commit suicide. Fortunately, she was not successful. But this led her onto a journey of getting treatment. Uh, clinical depression is something that you can't cure, but there are treatments for it. And she had a conversation with her family about the fact that clinical depression ran in the family. So once she began getting treatment for clinical depression, she realized that this was a conversation that really needed to be talked about in our community. And around the time that President Obama started his initiative for Black boys, she felt there needed to be some sort of initiative for Black girls. So she started an organization called um, Girl Smile, Black, Smile, Girl Smile. And what it is, it's an organization, a nonprofit, that in several cities around the country, um, and in fact, the, the cities have grown since COVID, presents programs directed at young Black girls between the ages of like, 10 and 13. Mm -hmm. And these young girls meet in sessions where they talk about their feelings, their emotions, they are taught practices and strategies to deal with everything from anger to depression. And they have a support group and a community where they can talk about things where that in their own families, there may not be a space to talk about. So she started out in, I think, Atlanta and Washington, but now since uh, COVID brought so much of an emphasis on this issue, she's expanded to many, many cities around the country. Great, that's, that's awesome. I took a look at her website and for all, we'll make sure to share that with you too. Mm -hmm. So everyone can take a look um, at all the great services that she has. There's there's a little bit something for everybody, for sure. Yes, yes, yes. Well, another good question that uh, came up was, what were some of the concerns that you had in doing your research, especially when you're dealing with a topic that has so many different layers? It's not just simply mental health. It's physical health. It's it's racism. It's socioeconomic issues. What were some of the, the concerns that you had when you were doing all of your research? Well, I think the main concern was that I didn't want to write a book that was overloaded with negative statistics mm. because the even as the health statistics that frame black women's lives are deeply, deeply concerning, I wanted to write a book that would be inspiring. And so the book is kind of a tapestry. Uh, it moves, I mean, it moves from the discussion of, R. Kelly to Zora Neale Hurston's book, Their Eyes Are Watching God. 
Um, I, I write about um, my own journey from strong black woman to new age strong black woman. I write about the mask that we wear. Uh, I write about grief and grieving and how in our community it is so common and how black women often have no place to really grieve deeply and meaningfully. And um, kind of the heart of the book for me is the stories of black women who I asked to tell me about the black women who were strong in their lives, how they became strong black women, and particularly women who um, had been through therapy. Mm -hmm. And because there still remains kind of a stigma in our community. There's a stigma Absolutely. in the whole society about uh, therapy and seeking mental health care. And it's, 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 it exists in our, in our community too. And, and a disproportionate number of black people who need mental health care do not get it. So at this point, yes. I would like to read a little section from one of the stories because the stories were very special to me. I mean, these are women who share their deepest um, journeys with me and their sacred, tender, precious stories that um, are often taboo, are often talked about in whispers, but they're the kind of stories that we need to speak about out loud. And this is a little section from a story that was shared with me by a young lady who um, graduated from Howard University and has made kind of a success of her life. But her early years were kind of difficult. And she grew up in a family where there was uh, alcoholism, there was emotional abuse, and she saw her parents with a very dysfunctional marriage. Mm -hmm. And she became the child, and every family has a child, an anchor child. You know, that child who's designated by the mother and father to be the strong one that they all lean on. Take care. Yes. Exactly. And so she talks about her journey from almost crumbling under the weight to healing. And she says she was carrying the weight of her family. And she says, and everything included while in college being the family breadwinner, using her scholarship money to buy food and pay household bills. Everything included watching her parents' 36 year marriage end, but because endings are rarely neat, seeing bitterness and distance and quarrels still erupt. And she says, because by then I was deeply into the superwoman, the strong black woman syndrome. All of this was my burden to carry. But in 19, Jamie took the first of many steps to lay her burden down by going to counseling for adult children of alcoholics. Prayer led me to counseling. All my life I've been told not to share our business, but prayer helped me realize it was okay to seek professional counseling outside the church. She found faith to endure and overcome in church, but in group counseling, she could hear and see through the din and the fog of her life at home. She began to put the pieces together like a puzzle. Her father told her, Stand up for yourself. Don't let white people keep you down. But that warning was followed by the accusation that she talked too much and had a smart mouth. Her mother said, be a proud black woman. Be strong. I love you. But don't tell anybody our business. Tell me what you feel. But I need you. You can handle this. You're the first one I call, the one I can always depend on. Jamie was crumbling beneath the burden. But in group therapy, that was one place where she could be herself, something she was still discovering. Jamie was crumbling beneath the burden and had what she would call the first honest conversation with her parents. I told them, I can't carry you. I can't carry my anger. I can't carry my hurt. She set boundaries and put herself first. I wasn't protected as a child, but now I was ready to protect myself. I told them, I love you, mom. I love you, dad, but I release you. I choose me. So there's many stories like that in the book. And I felt so glad to hear black women talking about that experience. Now, therapy isn't for everyone. And, and I want to share some myths to it. I want to talk about a couple of myths. People believe that you go into therapy when you've had a complete breakdown. No, you can go into therapy when you think you're about to have a breakdown. <laughs> yes. Uh, you look for a therapist the way you look for a good job. The first one may not work, 
the second one, you, you, you go through the therapist until you find the one that really you connect with and who understands you. I've been in therapy um, for various lengths of time for about three times in my life um, because I was going through things that I simply couldn't handle. And sometimes you go into therapy for a tune-up, okay? Yeah. So um, it's a very deeply important um, recourse to help us keep our emotional balance. That calibration of exactly. life. Exactly. Yes. That's, that's a perfect way to put it for sure. And, and speaking of all the, the great uh, input and research that you've done, talking with other strong Black women and women who have gone through therapy and all this. We have two women who are in our green room who would love to join the conversation as well, too. So I definitely want to introduce these two uh, fabulous ladies. We have Philippa Williams. She is the founder and blogger of GodInMe.org, a faith-based enterprise equipping others to fulfill destiny through the power of spiritual intimacy and transparency. She's a community leader, and she also has a nonprofit called I Look Like Love, a mobile diaper pantry and mentoring program for single mothers. She is a advocate and an expert for overlooked realities of those who have early childhood poverty, and she's recognized for her work throughout the community, a minister in training, and she is also has a book coming out in January 2022, God and You, Finding Your Place Forever. So welcome, welcome, Philippa. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Well, glad to be here. Glad to be here. Wonderful. Already enjoying the discussion. This is going to be good. Great. All right. We have coming up next, we have Cicely, Cicely Adriana. Cicely Adriana is the founder of CZB Innovations, LLC, which inspires leaders and young change agents to pursue careers, entrepreneurship, and create growth, mind, confidence, and purpose. Cicely Adriana's message is embodied by the repurposing of the strong friend label and false narratives surrounding self-care with the goal of transforming the lives of women of girls. She's devoted 16 years to serving the most vulnerable populations of homeless families and domestic violence, abuse, and sexual assault survivors. And like her counterparts here on today, she is an award winner as well throughout her community for her work. And she continues to lend her voice and time to serve others. So welcome, welcome to the team, Cicely. This All right. Is, this there you is go. Good. I'm excited to be here. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so we're going to do the, the mute mic moves most of the night, but we're going to make sure that everyone here ha has a voice. And I'm so excited to, to talk with everyone here. Uh, a number of first question that comes to mind is I wanted to share an image with each of you and kind of get your, your thoughts on it. And Marita kind of touched on it too, this image here. If you can see that, wearing the mask that we constantly do. What are your thoughts when you see an image like that or this one that we constantly see, this superwoman strong image taking over the world? Those are the ones we see often. What are your first thoughts when you see those? And anybody, feel free to hop right in. Well, when I think of the um, suit, when I see the superwoman image, you know, being a superwoman, it's it's a it's a double edged sword, because when you have convinced yourself that um, if you don't do it, it won't be done right, and that you have to solve everybody's problems there's a great sense of power. I mean, you feel enormously powerful. And that's why I think we don't want to let it go. But at the same time that we feel powerful, we're being diminished. And we don't realize that the relationships we have with other people are being corrupted. Because if we're never weak or uncertain or never step back, we're not being real with people. And we disempower them and take all the power unto ourselves. So when I see that superwoman, I see her so strong, but she's not realizing that she's also diminished at the same time. 
it's levels, it's two layers. You sew, sew, sew one side, what's on the other side? Oh, I saw you about to say something, Cicely, I'm sorry. Well, when I see it, the first thing I think is uh, the Superwoman um, photo. Um, I think about how it removes, removes the humanity from her. She is not allowed to have flaws. She is put on a pedestal. And the first thing that pops in my mind is exhausted. Um, the pulling the cape back is great. And um, uh, I can see where there could be some gratitude in that, some excitement in that, some power behind that. But eventually she's gonna have to put that back on and go back home. And when she does, she's human. And I don't think that that's one of the things that we are allowed to do as Black women, um, often overlooked. Um, as we move through the world, we are expected to be that for our families as caregivers, as mothers, as aunties, or whatever role we play in the lives of the people that we love. Uh, Shaylin, I think that the mask is the one that really drew my attention. And um, I think one of the things that we've heard the term for generations, people pleasers. Um, and that is so much of what we as women of color have been conditioned to be is people pleasers. And so um, what's going on behind that mask is um, we're being put in a position where our dreams, our aspirations, our desires for our own lives, for our own futures are being hidden away. It's not just a matter of, of uh, hiding our emotions and, and you know always being strong. No, you can't cry. No, you, you can't be vulnerable. But we're, we're hiding a part of ourselves that is desiring to grow. And so we're stunting, it's, it's the mask is stunting our growth. We're putting on this mask, it's our ceiling. It's, you know, I, I will go above and beyond for everyone else except myself. That was one of the challenges that I had starting the nonprofit when, uh, when God brought it to my attention that he had other aspirations for my life other than what I was doing. And uh, in a time of, of uh, private prayer, and I, I really felt him whisper in my ear, he said, when are you going to start investing this sweat equity into what I've given you? You're taking care of everybody else's dream, but your own. And I have given you a dream. So at what point are we going to put the sweat into your dream? And <laughs> it was a jolt. It was a, sh it was a shattering moment, but it was a wonderful revelation. Uh, and I was sick for a week after that because I had to literally, he had to recondition me to take off the mask and stop trying to please everybody else and stop trying to be the superwoman and be the woman that he called me to be. And so it was a process. It was almost like a detox. I was out of work for a week after I had that revelation. And when I went back to that job that I was in, I was never the same. I did the, I did what I had to do, but I was on a mission to transition. I had to take off that mask. And so when that, that came on the screen, um, you know, that, that really resonated with me. It really resonated with me. Oh, I told y'all it was going to be some gems tonight. I told you it was going to be that. <laughs> I love it. Well, just all the things that you mentioned definitely resonates with all of our viewers. And I know it resonates with me for sure. One of the things about changing the strong black woman ideology how can we all be a part of changing that process? Like it's it's easy for us to say it, but there are songs about strong black women. There are images, there are t-shirts, it's, it's out there. So how can we go about changing the process or the thought frame about, and Marita, you mentioned in your book, the new age strong black woman, how can we get to that step? site, maritagola.com. I have another website, um, new, the new strong black woman.com. And what I did was I did a series of interviews with just ordinary black women who talked about being new, strong black women, black women who, for example, had been homeless and after being homeless, healed from PTSD, um, a woman who suffered with chronic kidney disease, but learned how to care for her body and her mind while she was living with this. And I think often we're talking about a generational change. We're talking about something that we're the first army 
that signed up, that's reported for duty to make this change. And we're gonna have to keep enrolling future generations in that change. And a lot of times people think that it starts with something really huge, but actually it starts with small things. I'll give you an example. One of the uh, children in our family recently lost her stepfather. And I was with her and her sister taking them to the movies. And I said to the younger sister, I said, oh, I know you're really feeling sad because she was very, very close to him. And um, she said, and I said, I know you've, you've probably been crying a lot. And she said, no, Aunt Marita, I haven't cried. I'm holding it in. Mm -hmm. Now she's 10 years old, but already she's a strong black woman. Already she's gotten the message that she can't show emotion. So my task as her aunt is that when I'm with her to talk with her about feelings, talk with her about how I cry sometimes and how good it feels to release those emotions. And those kinds of conversations do have a powerful effect. One of the women in the book that I interviewed, I interviewed her for a story and then during COVID, after the book was you know, pretty much wrapped up, her partner died at the age of 33 of a heart attack. Mm. And he had gone to the hospital a couple of days earlier, but because of COVID, they just treated him in a very small way, presented him home. Three days later, he's totally in distress. She's driving him to the hospital and he dies on the way to the hospital in the passenger seat. Now, she has his child and she has a 12-year-old daughter from a previous relationship. And when I did an interview with her, which is also on my new website, she talked about, yes, she got into therapy and she took her daughter into therapy, but she let her daughter see her cry. She said, I didn't let her see all the tears because that would have been the Amazon River, <laughs> but I let her see some of my tears. And she cried in front of me and we cried together and we comforted one another. And so that that yeah. is preparing her daughter to be comfortable with vulnerability. And, and right in our homes, we can do a lot of this work. Absolutely. I agree. I think it, it really does. Um, it's, it's steps that we can take as individual women um, as we're recognizing and seeing how, uh, what's the residual effects on our own lives, on our health, on our well being. When we talk about strong black women, we try and live up to that expectation. And um, I think it's important for us to, to redefine if, you know, um, as um, Ms. Marita was talking about, uh, the, the modern strong black woman, the new strong black woman, we have to, re we have to redefine what strength is. Uh, what does it mean to be strong? Um, we've shifted from strong being, you know, a concept of us as a village coming together, rallying around one another, supporting each other in, in various capacities to being islands. And so that island mentality that I have to be isolated, I have to, I have to make it happen. I can't depend on anyone else so I've got to get it done. I've got to be my own ecosystem and, and do this thing on my own. Um, we, we have to pull away from that. And, and when we were talking about redefining strength, um, we have to take into account that, that strength doesn't always come with a title. Uh, you know, I, I love the, in the modern day, the, the idea of the, the boss lady, you know, and the, and the boss girl, I, I love that mentality but I do have a concern as to how much of that is drawing our young women into an island mentality versus a village. And so we, we, it's okay to have um, those, those people in our spaces that still have that Madhya uh, uh, spirit, that have that, that you know, mentoring mindset where we can pour into one another. We have to be open to that though. And we have to see that as a strength. You know, we, everything is so exposed at, at this point in society, social media and everything else that it's almost like if you're not exposed, if you're not on a platform, then you're not strong. You're not a representation of strength. And so we have to look at what really is, what is strength? 
when we look at the woman, the black woman, what does it mean to be strong? And can we be that for our, like she was saying, for our daughters and our granddaughters and be okay with who we are, recognize that as our own strength. I don't have to be on a platform to be strong. Yeah. Oh, all of that. <laughs> um, I would like, I would have to say, um, I, I understand faith was mentioned um, and how you uh, heard from God and there was this, um, this light bulb that kind of went on. My experience was nothing like that. Growing up in the church, um, Pentecostal, uh, burning bush, I've been baptized four times um, <laughs> in my, uh, my family and my mother's on the usher board, all of those great things. And for me, uh, when I really start to question that strong black woman moment, is when I had a complete crash and breakdown. As a single mother, um, I clearly remember one day um, I was working two jobs, uh, moved to Texas, um, no car, no job, uh, degree, connections, uh, but um, feeling like I needed to just start over completely. Um, and I remember driving my son to school and getting there and not remembering how to get home. I had so many things on my list of things to do. Like when I was, when I left work, I was going to get him here. We were going to go to baseball practice. I had to go home and cook. And I remember looking back in the car and saying to him, we're going to play a game today. You're going to tell mommy which way to go to get home. Because I knew that something was not right, but I wasn't quite sure where that was. When I finally did get home, I reached on the phone and I called my college roommate and I said, girl, something's not right. I don't know if, I, if I'm tired, if I need to take a nap. So that was my first thing. Well, maybe I'm just tired. Let me take a nap for a little while. Two hours later, four hours later, eight hours later, I'm still tired. Next week, I'm still tired. So at that point is when I realized that, okay, yes, um, something else has to, to give because I'm still a good mother. I'm still a good person. I'm still active in my community. I'm serving vulnerable populations of homeless families, getting them housing, encouraging them to go to therapy, but I'm not practicing any of the things that I do professionally um, and that I encourage those around me to do. Um, so for me, it had to come smack me upside the head where the cape had to fall off <laughs> so that I could come to an understanding that Something has to be different. Um, and at that point, also looking at my children, I realized that this was not something that I had prepared them for because I wasn't prepared for it. Although the church was in my family, I had a great family support system, but nobody explains on the day when the cape falls off. What do you do? Who do you turn to? Um, so that's that's something that I know has um, was the pivoting moment for me when I really start to try to figure out what does this strong really mean and and honestly I don't want it. It's it's interesting how you all had different instances of of wake up something needs to change I I don't want this <laughs> or there needs to be some new version of strength in my life and there was a a part in the book. It's one sentence in particular that just kind of caught my eye um, all the time. It was silenced girls become silenced women. And we don't speak about the things that need to change or they're in our mind because there's constantly spinning like I should do this. I should probably go get some help. But we don't speak it to our friends or reach out. So what are some of those habits or steps that others can take to even start that first step in reaching out and asking for help or saying, I'm strong, but I'm not that strong. <laughs> I was at a, I did a program two weeks ago and a woman um, stood up and she shared with the group that her father had recently died. And she was in that sort of automatic phase after her death where you're just going automatic. You're making plans for the funeral and you're, you're sidelining your grief. And she said, but I know um, I'm going to have to deal with my grief. How will I know when I need help? 
And she, I realized that she she was suffering from what a lot of black women suffer from, and that is the mind body disconnection. Mm. That is, we are so conditioned to feel that we have to do everything, have to report for duty every moment, that when our bodies are screaming for help, we tell them to shut up. We silence that voice. We censor it. We ex we exercise it. We surgically remove it. So there is something called the mind body connection where your body speaks to you because of all the input from the mind, the environment, et cetera. And you hear that, but with black women too often, there is a disconnect. We've muted the sound of our pain. And um, one of the things that I, I'm working on a companion book to the strong black woman, a kind of a workbook journal okay. and three foundational things that are important for me that have been important for me in my life. And I think are important just in general. One is I think that we need to say hello to ourselves. Um, black women are praying women and that's very powerful, but we also have a tradition of just meditating being quiet, being silent, being still, going for a walk in the woods. Yes. Uh, Rosa Parks did yoga, was a Buddhist. She meditated. And when you give yourself over on a regular basis to having a date with yourself, to connecting with your sister self inside, there is enormous wisdom that that self is going to tell you that nobody else can tell you. And she will tell you in the silence, in the quiet. And you have to listen to her regularly. The other thing is developing the ability to say yes in affirmation and no to avoid being misused and overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And making no, as I say in the book, a one word sentence. Period. And the third <laughs> thing is loving our bodies. Now we have a we live in a society that is mercilessly indifferent to the health of its citizens. And we know that we don't have universal health care because of racism. Because the people who make those decisions frankly don't want black people to have universal health care. That's documented. Mm. And Obamacare <laughs> has saved people's lives, but it's not enough. So we have to become protectors of this temple called our body. And we have to love our bodies and stop taking them for granted. Yes. Uh, for some of our bodies are like cars that have 300,000 miles on them <laughs> that haven't had a, an oil check in a year. Well, their first car. <laughs> and our bodies are amazing because we, we, we abuse them so much and they will take us to the limit. So say hello to yourself. Say yes in celebration, say no and mean it and love your body. And these are things that little bit by little bit by little bit practice will make them a part of your life that can save your life. Oh, such good tips. I'm going to be talking to myself today. I don't know about y'all, but I am <laughs> talking to myself. All right. Did y'all have anything you want to add before I move on? No? Okay, I'm gonna keep going then. <laughs> oh, you had something, Cicely. I did. When she said about the car and the mileage, one of the the things that I equated to being strong, um, or how what that looks like perceived from the outside to others, is um, I equated to a bridge. Um, the way people interact with you, your loved ones, um, uh, the people that you need, they run across you on a regular basis. They they trust the fact that you're going to be there. Um, and there's a poem that I wrote where I describe it as um, someone being um, driven over me um, free mm -hmm. and taxed for a free ride down memory lane um, with no um, checks on my mental health or on the foundation of me, except about two times. And that's usually on Valentine's Day and on Mother's Day. <laughs> that's when people go, yeah. hey, how are you doing? How you doing? Here's a break. <laughs> And it's like, okay, I'm appreciative, but what about the other 330 days? And then it's usually um, one of those times where, you know, it's a couple of hours and then they 
forget and then they go about their day and it's what do you need poof what do you need um so that's one part about it um you ask what is it that we can do as uh, um, this new version of uh, the strong woman um one of the things that i do in my circle is i am very honest i'm that strong friend that's very real i can go out with you like i'll probably go out this evening um, but what i will tell my friends is i can meet you at happy hour but I do virtual visits with my therapist on Thursdays. And so I tell them, as soon as, take some back, girl, as soon as I get out of therapy, I'm there. Um, we have to be able to have these conversations. And in my home, the beauty of COVID, of all the negative things is, it made virtual therapy so available to us in the privacy of your own home. So my children know, my son especially, he's 15, that when mommy goes into her room and I have to lock in the bathroom because I have a, a little one, lock the door. It says mommy is on her time with her teachers, how I explain to my child. I'm talking to my teacher. So I get one hour while I'm with my therapist and it's for me. So that's another thing. I think we have to be honest about the fact, yes, I have a therapist. She looks like me. She's awesome. I've been there with her for six years. And you use the word, um, Mrs. Golden, you use the word tune up. That is exactly what I call it. I need my tune up. For everybody else to be happy, you might want to let me get mine. Hey, mama ain't happy. Nobody's happy. <laughs> exactly. What kind of makes me think about um, another question that definitely came to mind. Lauren uh, Carson, she had mentioned that she promotes mental health literacy. And just that phrase in itself is one you don't hear very often. You hear of financial literacy, mm -hmm. you hear of uh, literacy in general period, uh, or, but not mental health literacy. And talking to your young ones, how do you even start to have the conversation of talking to your family or young ones or others in your family about mental health and reaching out? I think one of the things that you have to do is help them to um, understand that they have a voice, that that they actually have a voice um, in the earth, and that they they are meant to to be heard in the earth, and it's okay to have a voice, um, and that we are here to nurture our voice. Our voice is to do something. You're you're here for a reason. Um, a lot of times, especially with young children. And I had this, my, my son, he's, he's grown now, but uh, he was naturally an introvert. And, um, and so um, very articulate, um, you know, in, in kind of a one-on-one -on -one conversation when he got to know you, then, you know, he would, he would open up, but he would, you know, kind of roll back into the shadows when he was around um, what I used to call squeaky wheels, people who just naturally have a voice to, or an inclination to be more verbal. And, um, and when I started to see that with him as a young child, um, I, I tried to really, I didn't want to take away because you know him being an introvert is really a part of who he is, but I didn't want that to be his excuse for not speaking up and having a voice. And so as I transitioned into the nonprofit world and working with expecting mothers, I started to see a lot of that, a lot of that, and it's like, I, you know, I, everyone else is, is kind of planning my life. I'm, I'm living my life as a blank page, you know, and now I've gotten myself into a situation. And so, you know, if I didn't have a voice before, I certainly don't have, it. people don't see me as having anything of value to say now or to present now. And so as a part of the mentoring, we have to encourage them and nurture their voice, help them to find their voice and actually see the value in their voice. And so I think that's a conversation that has to happen ver very early on with our children. Uh, it has to happen in the context of co-parenting, uh, even to where we speak positively of, you know, fathers speak positive of mothers, mothers speak positive of fathers, that we create a peaceful environment so that child can't voice can be nurtured. Um, we're dealing with a lot of divorce um, families now. And so we have to work together to create a place where they can engage in their voice and, and even if it's a difference of opinion, be able to articulate that in such a way as they don't feel like they're going to be um, judged or cast aside. 
because that's one of the things, particularly for our young girls, is that we, you know, and me myself as a young woman, some of the things I did not say is because I felt like I was going to be, and this is, this is in my own circle of people that I knew loved me. I felt like I would either be judged or in some way cast aside. And so we have to create circles and opportunities where we can nurture the voice of our younger generations. And I mean, we need to do that at any generation <laughs> at this point. Yeah. All of us need to feel comfortable with the fact that we have a voice and uh, and find those safe places where we can articulate that voice. It's, it's interesting that you it's mentioned um, mentoring and um, listening to our voices, because I think as, as Black women, we have the tendency to want to to heal and take care and guide. And we are in a sense, we try to be the therapist to the people who need their own therapy, not necessarily. But when it comes to us, it's a little bit harder to do so. A fact that I came across, I wanted to share with you guys here, is that Black women are amongst the most undertreated groups for depression in the U.S. And this is from BlackHealthFacts.com from uh, American Psychiatry. And that thought really resonated with me as us being undertreated because it's not that there's not a need. It's not that it doesn't exist. It's that it's not being taken advantage of or that uh, in a, a previous session, the resources may not be known. So when you're looking for resources and all of you all are advocates in the community already, are there resources that you guide people to? Um, I know Lauren Kaysen has one resource. Uh, Marita, was there any other resources that you wanted to share as well too? Well, a very good resource that I found is um, Therapy for Black Girls, mm. which is a great website by Dr. Joy Harden Braden down in Atlanta. And on, I think she has something like 32,000 followers, but she has on her website, if you're looking for a African-American or culturally sensitive um, therapist anywhere in the country. You can put your zip code in and there's a list of people in your area. She publishes a weekly newsletter. She has a podcast and she just does a lot of community building online to keep um, black women focused on mental health and learning about mental, mental health literacy, as you said, you know, a minute ago. And talking about depression, many people don't really know what depression is. Um, clinical depression is one thing, being sad is something else. Mm -hmm. And where, where would you learn the difference, okay? Even when you go to your, your regular doctor, you're not necessarily going to talk about that. He, he or she may say, well, have you gotten any sleep? So that the whole, lexicon, the language, the vocabulary of how to diagnose our feelings and our emotions is absent from discussion. So mental health literacy is really important because black women, many, many black women are clinically depressed and do not know it. Um, Lauren Carson had clinical depression in her family and no one had ever talked about it. And black families need to start, one of the things we need to we need to talk about our family history. Oh, yes. Uh, so often we don't know what grandma and great grandpa died of, and that's, Im and that's impact on us and our children. And we have a right to know that information. So we need to talk about our family medical history, our family psychological history, and bring that out of the closet. Families often don't want to talk about it because there may be suicide. There may be, quote, shameful issues, but we have to be the ones in the family that are brave enough to start that conversation. Absolutely. Yes. And I like how you put, we can, uh, for physical things, we can see the symptoms and we know X, Y, Z, we have the flu, we have the cold. When it comes to mental needs, it may not be as clear. Mm -hmm. We may have to really actually go to talk to someone yeah. who is trained in that and help us to see. Because for many years, for example, the, the diagnosis of bipolar is only about 15 or 20 years old. Many years ago, people just thought someone was eccentric or unreliable. 
or erratic. Now we know that there is, there is something in their brain that is causing the symptoms that we see. So that um, we're now at a point where there's all this study being done and we need definitely to increase our literacy. Absolutely. And you kind of mentioned also um, talking to your families and we need to open up and tell our stories. And as a writer, I know it's very important. You put a lot of your family history within the book, <laughs> which what do your family think about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my parents are deceased and they raised me to be a writer. So I know they're they're very proud. Um, there is a section in the book where I wrote about my sister and um, reveal some things, but uh, what I was really revealing was an open secret, mm. <laughs> an open secret in the family. And I didn't reveal it just to, to reveal it. I revealed it because if I was going to write a book about a strong black woman, I had to write about my mother as a strong black woman. I had to write my sister as a strong black woman. And as, as I tell the people I work with in my writing classes, when you're writing a memoir, you want to write with radical honesty, but radical compassion at the same time. And I actually reached out to my sister's son and shared with him that I was going to write about this open secret. And he thanked me. He said, yes, I, because my sister had died. And he said, yes, thank you for telling me that. I heard those stories too. Thank you. So yes, I think our stories are very meaningful and very powerful and they connect us one to yeah. another. It's always encouraging to read someone else's story, even if you haven't gone through um, that particular instance. It's When I read parts of your story, I could relate and see almost someone that reminded me of someone within one of the stories, whether it was your sister, whether it was your mother, someone resonated with me. And I think that's true. And the other two ladies here, Cicely and Philippa, you both are writers as well too. So when you're writing, I'm sure the same instances come across too. You mentioned um, uh, about resources. Mm -hmm. um, one of the ones that was, um, very key for me um, is that I had a wonderful HR person at one of my previous jobs. Um, I work in social service and you know, the pay is not wonderful. You're not doing it for the money. You're doing it for the passion of your work, but it's very easy to uh, overextend yourself, um, trying to be the go all for everyone in any service capacity. Um, so um, one of the things that our HR person was very big about was the employee assistance program. Um, and letting us know that for my particular uh, place where I worked, um, they had benefits that were completely separate. And she emphasized it's confidential. It's not um, going to go back to your supervisor or anything. It's an outside service where you can have access to um, um, three to five, three to six different uh, mental health visits if you needed those. Um, they also would help you with like caregiving services, um, other resources, family planning, um, uh, as far as like maybe trans creating a power of attorney for your, um, uh, if you have aging loved ones. And so um, I'll, I'll be honest, that's one of the resources that I reached out to when you're kind of in transition um, um, between employment sometimes. Um, and I found that very, very, very useful. Um, and it at least gets you in the door to be able to um, have some conversations because I'm a big advocate of therapy. I, I believe we all should need to get a little bit pray and then go see your therapist. <laughs> um, but that's a resource that I think is really big. And then um, you mentioned something about um, getting permission to tell a particular story. Um, most recently, um, I've been working um, as a domestic violence advocate and a coordinator for a domestic violence shelter previously. So my job was to train um, the advocates for the crisis hotline. And I've been doing that for years. But it wasn't until actually the pandemic um, that I found myself working with an organization that um, highlights survivors, to which I was finally able to disclose that I am a survivor of domestic violence, um, which was very interesting for me to 
say out loud in your professional work, it's not allowed, it's not appropriate to disclose those kind of things. One of the things that I did before, it, um, the organization does a whole photo shoot campaign and it's, it's across the country. But one of the conversations I had was with my 15 year old son. And I asked them, I said, if mommy is on a billboard and it's not gonna have you know, negative images on there, but if I'm encouraging survivors to speak out, if I am advocating for the domestic violence to end across this country for men and women, how would you feel? Because people may ask me some questions. And at 15 years old, he told me, if it's gonna help somebody, it's okay. Mm -hmm. And when I tell you that was a proud mommy moment for me, um, because if he would have said that he was uncomfortable, I would not have done it. Definitely would not have. So I would have continued to advocate um, from the backside, from the worker bee aspect. But COVID and that downtime and that being alone time really exposed some things where I felt as though that was a different side of my message that and my advocacy that needed to go out. And it was another opportunity for me to throw the cape on the floor and say, hey, this happened to me, although I am going in, putting people in housing and telling people to go to therapy and working directly with domestic violence sh um, shelters and administrators, um, I did have that experience that I was not allowed to talk about because it was not appropriate for a work setting. I love that. The power of your voice and your pen definitely can change and move mountains, whether it's in your own family. Uh, I know in my own circle, when one of us started therapy the others just kind of added it on slowly but surely and it's like i see you changing oh okay <laughs> and so it's so it's a movement so i'm very happy to hear all of that i have a couple of other um i always find little cute little quotes and, and images that kind of spur your mind thinking a couple that i saw here what about the issue we don't talk about how reality of being a black woman in america just simply being a black woman in America can wear away at even the most resilient and privileged of us. We may be in positions of power, we may be at the top of our game, but just simply our existence, and especially you mentioned the pandemic and the social unrest from last summer, all of those things on top of simply being who we are. What are your thoughts on just that? Well, I, just, uh, um, I decided that I wasn't going to let uh, being a black woman in America wear me down. There you go. <laughs> and uh, that I was going to be able to find joy, peace, happiness, write 19 books, be yes. amazing, okay, be bad, all I of that, <laughs> even as systemic racism exists. And I'm dedicated with everything I do, everything I write, to dismantling it. Um, it's like if you have all you can do can because all you can control is your attitude. Is your attitude one of just, you know, enduring or is it overcoming and changing? So that I think that that's the attitude that's very dangerous, that we're worn down. But because I have practices in my life that emphasize joy and possibility, that puts a check. Here's systemic racism. Here's positive joy. Here's who I am. Here's what how I'm talking back to it. So it's like it negates it. I can't make it disappear, but I can talk back to it and I can protect myself and my family from it. So and we've always done that. Our heroes and our sheroes are heroes and sheroes because they did that, because they fought against racism did not let it overwhelm them and managed to live lives that were joyous at the same time. That is definitely power for sure. Ladies, you want to add anything? No? Okay. <laughs> There's another one I saw. It, this one just caught me. I was feeling some sort of way about going to therapy because in my head, it's like black people don't do therapy. And I'm sure we've all heard that. We don't do therapy. We pray it away. We don't do therapy. Or we wait for it to, to go away on its own. Or you just tough it out. We don't do therapy. What are your thoughts on just dispelling that whole saying, period, in the Black community? <laughs> well, 
Well, I, I think it, like we were talking before, it absolutely has to be something that we start to impart to our children early on. Um, I love what um, Cecily was saying about uh, even the interaction that she has with her children and, uh, and in their own language, in their own way, she lets them know that there's a, a period of time where, where mommy has to take care of mommy, mm -hmm. where mommy has to make her, her, her health and well being a priority. And she's no less mommy because she does that. As a matter of fact, it makes her a better mommy. So, you know, let me have my time. And so I celebrate that for her. Um, but I think that's something that we as, uh, as black women have to uh, celebrate for each other. That if, you know, if we are at a point where we, we are considering therapy, you know, we should be able to at least with our, with our sisters, our homegirls, our, our BFFs, whatever you want to call it, auntie or whoever be able to say, you know, this is something that I am thinking about and not feel like I'm going to be chastised for it. Encourage and so, um, so we, we have to be very conscious of that. If, you know, we, we can't keep pe perpetuating the stigma um, because that, that will automatically, you know, create an environment where we'll draw back into our shell. Um, and so, you know, I think even just telling the, the, the simple stories, the testimonies, even like we've heard tonight, um, what we're hearing, even in the, in the, the time that we have, um, here, you know, I'm hoping we'll plant the seeds for someone to say, you know what, I need to reconsider this. You know, th this is something that I can do. This is something, it's okay for me to take care of myself. This is part of self-care. We need to start incorporating that in the self-care conversation and not make it to where therapy has to be something separate from that. That mental wellness is something separate from, from self-care. We do a lot with it with physical care, but you know, sometimes we don't do as much conversation when we're talking about self-care when it has to do with the mental aspect of who we are and how we need to take care of our, our mental well-being. I think for um, me, the way I try to explain it um, or even have the, open that conversation is to say, it's not like talking to your girlfriend. It's not, because mm. that's what some people say. You can talk yeah. to your girlfriend. And, and the honest truth is I'm usually that strong friend that gets that call. I'm super encouraging. I'm the one, you know, I'm a, I don't like the term ride and die for a lot of reasons, but that's a whole nother talk. Um, but um, that's usually who I am. But I think if we share that you can have that conversation with your sister circle or whoever that is, you can still pray and, and do those things. But for me, therapy gives me tools. Just like I need God to keep me from, you know, cussing somebody out at work. You don't want to do that. That's not a good thing. I might need those same tools to, you know, know how to speak to someone in a relationship, um, how to manage my emotions. And when I go to my therapist, what she gives me are tools and strategies that I can pull out when she's not around that I need. What I don't want to happen is to be in a situation um, with myself or in interacting with someone else, and I don't have the tools there. So that's how I explain it to the people in my circle and my nieces um, and, and the women who I come in contact with. Fill your bag with as many tools as possible. Um, you mentioned meditation is something. Um, I remember being told by church members that meditation, because I'm Christian, meditation was a Buddhist kind of thing. And they had this whole mindset that I was worshiping the devil because I said I was meditating, doing yoga. If I am doing yoga, I might be saying the Lord's Prayer because that's all I know. I could be. Although I grew in the church and I know a lot more than that, I guarantee. My daddy made sure of that. But explaining to them that it's how you use the tools. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I approach it. Um, with the, my circle to make it plain, you know what I mean? Like it, if you if you make it too big, people can't grasp it, they can't own it. They can't even wrap their minds on whether or not to nibble on it. Because if they can do it privately, what I found is if you give them a nibble, just like with anything else, they'll see the difference and they'll make the change slowly but surely in certain ways, even if they don't tell anybody. And that's what I want you to do. I just want you to try it and see. See, that's perfect all of that perfect for sure and right along a good segue into my next thought as well which marita in your book you there's one part of the book where there uh, are 
a therapist. I can't recall her name right, right at the moment, but um, she says she gets together with her other therapist friends and they do the practices that they teach and they tell all of their all of their clients to go through. And they have moments of going out into the woods and calm, relaxed, sitting with themselves and all of that, just those ideas. But there are also moments within your book you mentioned of self-care. And Philippa, you mentioned a few things about self-care and changing that conversation. What are some uh, traditions of self-care that you guys have seen or that you've seen as well uh, from Black women historically? And what are some self-care habits that kind of sustain you as well? Well, I think that organizations like Black women's sororities, for example, um, allow Black women to gather together to engage in activities that were activities that were beneficial to the community and the race and to through all of those activities bond as women as well as feel a sense of power over a situation that was designed to make them feel powerless mm -hmm. uh, in pretty much every work situation probably every white institution where I've worked, uh, university, I formed sister circles with other black faculty, other black women faculty. And just meeting once a month with these women to have lunch or potluck dinner was an enormous um, stress reliever. We could vent, we could complain, we could laugh, we could share, we could strategize. And in my life now, I have a circle of writer friends that I get together with, a circle of women that I hike with, a circle of women that I meet um, with on Zoom. And so these, and for example, when I was a single mother, I started a single parents group. And that's how I met my husband, mm. who I've been married to for 30 years. <laughs> in the single parent group. <laughs> well, he was a friend of one of the women in the single parent group. And she gave a party one night to celebrate her divorce. And he was supposed to be on a plane to the Dominican Republic. But she uh -huh. told him, if you don't come to my party, I'll never forgive you. He walked in the door and I knew that was my husband. Wow. And two weeks later, we decided if we were still together, we'd get married. You say two weeks? Yeah, yeah. We <laughs> waited a year, but oh, we, knew, okay. we knew we were connected. We knew we were soulmates, but wow. we wanted to give it a year. So I'm always reaching out. I'm always connecting. I'm always seeing how I can bring women specifically together to enlarge me. And, uh, and ways in which I can enlarge them. And just being together is with other Black women is so therapeutic, so therapeutic. And one of the women in the book talked about um, having gone into therapy and getting very comfortable with talking about it. And when she talked about it to her group of friends, several of them would come over to her kind of on the down low quietly, mm -hmm. nobody looking and say, you know, I'm glad you talked about that. I always wondered what therapy was like. <laughs> I we trying to get notes. Go. Exactly, exactly. You got to but, yourself. Yeah. And, and we, we really have to be angel warriors for each other. We really do. For example, one of the women in the book that I profiled, she recently, I saw her recently, and I saw, I said, you know, there's something, what's going on with you? There's a disconnect. You know, this, your writing is so vibrant and so alive, and yet you're presenting to the world in a very odd way. What's going on? Hmm. And she didn't say anything. She just sort of took it in. And then a couple of weeks later, she sent me an email and she thanked me. She said, thank you, Marita, for saying that. Thank you for seeing that something was wrong. And she said, what was wrong is that when you interviewed me for the book, my life was one way. Now, I, 
I, I became a mother mm -hmm. who was homeschooling her son because Ooh. of COVID. Oh, God. I'm in a PhD program. I'm still a wife and I'm still teaching at a university. And many of the skills that I had gained in therapy to help me create a balanced life, I stopped using them. The and time. what you saw was the product of that. So she went back into therapy for a tune-up. But she thanked me for, for acknowledging something's wrong. What's, what's wrong? You know, I'm just saying, I didn't say you look like crap. Yeah. Or, uh, I just said something's wrong. It's a disconnect. And I really appreciate that she thanked me for saying that. So we have to reach out to our sisters. Check we get it. the right to do that because we love them. Yes. I, I like how you, uh, your convening and bringing women together is refreshing in your form of self-care. That's what keeps you energized and upbuilt. That's beautiful. I love that. What about you ladies? Any self-care tips and tools and tricks you're using? I think the writing for me is, um, is, is the core of my self-care, uh, free writing in particular, where I just purge. <laughs> I just purge uh, yeah. early in the morning. Uh, the, the most recent blog that I, that I, I put out this week was, was I described that experience um, and what it meant for me to just be in that quiet stillness um, you know, where the world had, had not invaded my space yet mm. and just going in. And it doesn't matter if it's pretty and it doesn't matter if it's legible and it doesn't matter if I cuss. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's yours. It's, yours. <laughs> it's mine. It's mine. And I can own that moment. And I can, I can, you know, if I need to cry in that moment, then then that's that's what needs to happen. If I need to purge, what however I need to purge, then I can do that. Um, and so for for me, um, and I encourage whether someone you know professes to be a writer or not. You know, we talk about journaling, you know, and that kind of thing. And so, but but I think it's a deeper thing where. You know, even sometimes with journaling, people, ex you know, have this expectation that it has to be perfect and it has to be, you know, just in case somebody reads it, it needs to just, you know, it just needs to be just so. No, you need to get down and, and dirty with it. You need to tear up the page. There needs to be blood on the page. That's what I call it. Blood on the page. Well, <laughs> right. <laughs> the, and, and so and be comfortable in that and know that when you when you rise up from that, that, you know, whatever that negative thing, whatever that weight was, the, leave the weight on the page. Leave the weight on the page. Don't just journal to be cute. Don't just journal because it's trendy or popular. Leave the weight on the page. I, it, it's so um, healing. It's a it's a healing experience for me. Yeah, I hear that. Don't yeah. journal to be cute. I like leave the blood on the page. <laughs> yes, I love that. Don't, don't leave, journal. Don't journal to be cute. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I will say that uh, for me, uh, one of the things that I'm an advocate for, uh, being a single mom, being on a budget, um, I am a staycation queen. My mm. family knows, uh, my, my kids knows, I will get on Groupon on a Wednesday, and it's a lot easier to find a babysitter or somebody to hang out at your house uh, during the middle of the week instead of on the weekends. So I will book a hotel when they're like 25 bucks, 40 bucks during the week. Nobody's there. Like you on. <laughs> I do the same thing. <laughs> you, know, you know what kind of service you get when it's just you in the building? So that's one thing that I do. Um, <laughs> another thing is I give myself permission to leave those clothes there. Mm. Leave them there. They, yes. okay. they will be there tomorrow and they're clean. They are. <laughs> but I don't have to necessarily do that because sometimes trying to deal with that, I could better use my time to um, run down and get myself an ice cream and sit in my car for a little while. I know, I know all of you probably do that. I, that's one of the things that I definitely do. Um, and um, uh, Golding, you mentioned something about the, the Greek stories. I'm a member of a, a Greek sorority. And one of the things that helped me when I was spiraling, uh, 
uh, kind of in depression and not knowing it is one, I could, I would be in my house, I would go to work, come home, go to work, come home, drop the kids off of school and just cycle out of that. And, you know, your kids know um, they're taken care of, we're not going anywhere. But after working from home um, for so long, I would use the sorority meetings as an opportunity to have to put some clothes on. You got to put the face on, to get dressed. So I may have looked a hot mess, barely showered or whatever was going on, but I knew. And then something about being in that room with those women talking about service or doing whatever it is that we were doing, planning the business side and the fun side of it um, gave me an opportunity to recharge that I didn't appreciate. Now, during this time, I was not going to therapy either. So it wasn't until I got into therapy a little bit more consistently that I realized how I was yearning for something. And so my band-aid was really getting dressed and going to those kind of events to kind of push me through. So I appreciate those, those opportunities to be able to do that and um, create. I guess they didn't know, but they were really a part of a sister circle that was therapy for me. And I was just showing up and excited to be in a room with beautiful, smart, intelligent women. Mm. And, and, and a postscript to Cicely, because I've been, um, I discovered that many hotels around the country now have something they'll call um, a daycation, where you can check into the hotel from 10 to 4 <laughs> or 8 to 5. And so you and, and it's not like at a reduced rate. So you don't even have to check in overnight. Yeah. So once I discovered that, <laughs> you know, I was on that. OK, immediately. But I really appreciate your sharing that about checking in the hotel. And also, I do days of silence. Um, I often go on silent whole retreats. Day? Like a whole day? <laughs> Girl, that's nothing. I, I've gone for weekends of silence. And you know, people so and, wonderful and, and you feel so replenished. But a lot of times you I, w I will wake up and tell my husband, today I'm going to be silent. Um, he insists that I give him 24 hours notice so that he knows the night before. <laughs> But I'm not silent because I'm not mad. I'm not mad. Right, exactly. <laughs> but but it it is a really replenishing activity, and um, no phone, no computer, just me going inside. I'm doing. I'm going. So you don't have to go to a monastery. I'm gonna think. About you don't it. have to go to the woods. You can be living. You can do it everything, but have a mental attitude that is about replenishment and going inside. And and have a wonderful experience. So I hear you on the hotels, but but days of silence are very very powerful. Half a day of silence, any day where you're just inside inside. A friend of mine joked and said, "Oh my God, I don't want to be the first person you meet after coming off of a day of silence." <laughs> I said, "Actually, no. You want to be the first person because I am so chill and so happy. You wouldn't believe it." <laughs> I may have to try. I'm gonna start with 30 minutes of silence. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'm gonna start. Up, yeah, I, I don't know if I could do. It. I talk in my head. I don't know. <laughs> of course, you're talking into your head, but the energy is used differently. Just try it. Okay, bit, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna give it a shot. I think my uh, most of my self care is dirt. Like I love to be outside. If I can physically put my feet, hands, or something in some dirt and grass. It recharges me and resets yeah. me. Yeah. So I try to go to the country and get a little yeah. dirt. But I know we are running close on time. And I knew this would happen with all you beautiful ladies on here talking about all the, the great gems you're dropping. So before we wrap up, there are a couple of other little um, graphics I wanted to share. And I'll be sure to share these as well um, post of it too. And they just give some interesting ideas on self-care and uh, just reminding us that the strong black woman idea, changing that idea is not just for our mental health, but for our physical health as well. And so not thinking it's one or the other, it's holistically that we need to change that idea. So one of the, the images I see here is what seeking therapy means. It means that you're human, you're brave, you want to change all the positive things that come from taking that first step when seeking therapy. And you can go to Black Female Therapist 
and they have a whole lot of uh, resources and positive affirmations. And they even have where you can uh, set up an affirmation text and it sends you one every day and at the start of every week on positive things to work on, on positive things to put in your mind. So a lot of helpful things for you there. Another good one here is, this one came from California Black Women Health Project, 12 Commandments of Good Mental Health and what that means. Marita mentioned knowing your family's mental health history, talking to your family about what that means, acknowledging your feelings, your thoughts, um, committing to fun and relaxing activities like all the ladies mentioned, and that you're worth it. Make yourself a priority and it's okay it is okay to have a moment to yourself. Whether you want a moment of silence, whether you want a staycation, daycation, or vacation, <laughs> you can do that. And it's okay. So I want to thank all of you beautiful women for being here today. Thank you, Marita, for taking time. Thank you, time. Sharon. Thank you. This and I'm so glad to meet beautiful. the other two, with Cicely and Philippa. Thank you. Thank you all and everyone as well. You know, I always like to end with a quote. So I'm always going to end bookmaker things with a quote. And this is my favorite lady here, Maya. When women take care of their health, they become their best friend. Remember that, y'all. All right. So if you haven't already gotten Miss Marita's book, pick it up. The Strong Black Woman, How a Myth Endangers the Physical and Mental Health of Black Women. Thank you, Cicely. Thank you, Philippa. Thank you, Marita, for all of your help this evening. And you all have a wonderful and blessed night. Thank you.